Welcome to the Behavioral Sciences section of our Practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 11 to 15. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can attempt them on your own. Here's question 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 11, it says signal detection theory is a subset of which of the following fields of psychology? So we're talking about signal detection theory. Which field of psychology does that fall under? So signal detection theory is a theory which talks about how we detect signals. So figuring out what is an actual signal and what do we pay attention to and differentiating it from noise. So for example, if you're focused on other things in your environment and you're not really actively looking out for your name, but just someone happens to say your name, even though you're not focused on it, you were able to pick up that this is like a proper signal that you should pay attention to rather than someone saying someone else's name, which would just be noise to you. All of that, it, it's, it's an example of something that falls under signal detection theory. And then which field of psychology does it fall under? It's not option A, the Gestalt principles. This is related to more so the eyes and the ways in which we perceive different objects around them, around us, so in our envir environment. For example, if things are grouped together, then instead of seeing a bunch of individual dots that are present and happen to be in the shape of a square, when they're grouped together, we would just see a square as a whole. All of those different principles and how we view things and all the tricks that our brain plays based on things that we view with our eyes, that all falls under option A. And then in option B, this is correct. This is something which includes signal detection theory. So psychophysics is relating psychology and fit, like physical physical signals that we see. Any physical signal that you can get, such as any physical signal or sensation, such as an actual touch or hearing things. And then how does that relate to mental processes? So psychology, that all, all falls under psychophysics. So that is correct. Option C is talking about theories of consciousness and then it's not really signal detection theory isn't talking about consciousness and things like the subconscious and different types of consciousness and what is consciousness. It's not really related to consciousness. It kind of already assumes that consciousness is a thing and it more so talks about how we detect whether something is a signal or not. So consciousness, it might play a part in terms of like us subconsciously listening to the signal, but signal detection theory doesn't really go into depth about different types of consciousness. And finally, psychoanalysis, this is more so related to things like subconscious thoughts you have and how that might affect your behavior. This is not related to signal detection theory. In question 12, I say social facilitation describes a phenomenon of what? So pretty much what is social facilitation? So social facilitation is when something is facilitated or your action is assisted by a social factor, meaning if you are able to do something like play the piano when you practice on your own you're just by yourself and you might be pretty good but when you go on a stage the social facilitation might help you out so the presence of the audience kind of gives you a boost and helps you perform even better and of course this varies with things depending on whether you're good at the task or not but social facilitation usually is when the environment or an audience is helping you or facilitating you at something that you're already good at so we're looking for an answer like that Option A is saying individuals from various cultures learning the norms of the majority culture. No, it's not that. That is pretty much just assimilating into a different culture. Option B is talking about using government and centralized agencies to promote cultural norms. No, this is just one way in which we control which norms are followed in a society. C is talking about disinhibition of individuals when they're in large groups, this is something else. This is something like de-individualization where you kind of lose your sense of self when you're in a large group. But social facilitation should be someone performing an act and then the social environment around them assisting in the act. And then finally, option D is correct. It's saying people performing differently with respect to, with respect to tasks when others are watching. So when others are watching you, you might perform better or maybe this the presence of other people might make you do worse, but you perform differently when other people are around. So it's it's the presence of an audience. That's what social facilitation is talking about. 
And so option D is the only one which most clearly relates to that. In question 13, it says when driving by an unemployment line, observers are more likely to think that people in the line must have done something wrong to be out of work. But according to research on attribution theory, how do people in the line think about why they're in the line? So you have to think that observers, so people who are looking at this from the outside, they think that the people in line have done something wrong. And now we're talking about attribution theory, and then we're talking about people in the line. So people on the outside will look at something and then say that it's based on dispositional factors. So that's what the fundamental attribution theory is. It's going to say that's because of the core characteristic traits of the person. That's why they're in this situation. So people from the outside are going to be like, it's because these people have done something wrong. That's why they're out of a job. And the fundamental attribution theory, it, it further extends to say that people, on when they're talking about themselves, so on their own, they think that they, they have things happen to them because of situational factors. So it's because of the environment around them. So how do the people in the line think about why they're in the line? It's not because of something that's a core characteristic trait of them. It's not anything that they've done, but it's something about the environment. So we're looking for an answer like that. Option A is saying people in the line are more likely to blame themselves for being at fault. That's incorrect. They would not say anything about themselves. So that's incorrect. They wouldn't say it's like an internal thing. They wouldn't blame themselves. But B is a much better answer. According to the attribution theory, it would say that people in the line are more likely to blame the economy. So they blame an external factor. They say, it doesn't really matter what I did. I'm not the person at fault. I didn't do something wrong. I was still trying hard to get a job and keep it and maintain it. It's the economy. It's just bad right now. That's why I don't have a job. That is something which falls in line with the attribution theory. Option C is saying people in the line are more likely to blame a character flaw or bad habit. No, that's incorrect. That would be the same as option A, that they would blame themselves, but that's incorrect. And then D is saying people in the line may vary their responses depending on whether or not they believe the world is fair. No, this is kind of trying to make you think of the just, the just world hypothesis or just world fallacy but that's kind of irrelevant to what we're talking about right now we're talking about the fundal and attribution theory and that states that once again people when they're looking at other people when someone is observing someone else they will say that the situation they're in is because of their core characteristic traits whereas when something happens to them it's because of the environment and so d is not really relevant to this and we are not going to say that they're responses are going to vary either and so d is incorrect in question 14 it says in a wealthy neighborhood one less wealthy family feels excluded socially because they drive an economic vehicle rather than a luxury vehicle what is this an example of well we're in a wealthy neighborhood but then we just happen to have a less wealthy family so a less wealthy wealthy family is comparing themselves to other families around them who are more wealthy, they feel that they're excluded. And so what is this? Are they actually in poverty? No, they're not, because you can't really be poverty in poverty if you live and are able to sustain a life in a wealthy neighborhood. And also you are able to afford and drive an economic vehicle. So it doesn't really seem like they're in poverty. So they're not in absolute poverty, but B is cor correct. Relative poverty is something that can describe their situation, why they feel socially excluded. So absolute poverty is a universal threshold where if you're below this line, then you're in poverty. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. So that is just if someone doesn't have access to the basic needs of survival, like food, water, shelter. But these people, they have all of that. So we can't say that they're in absolute poverty. But then relative poverty is being not so well off compared to the other people around you. So these people in relation to the other neighbors around them, they are kind of below a poverty line relative to the other, the other families in the neighborhood. And so yeah, relative poverty does apply to this situation. C is talking about a health disparity. And that would be if there is a difference in health between different uh, geographical locations based on socioeconomic status but if both of these people are living in a wealthy neighborhood then it seems like their health is probably going to be very similar they have access to the same health services and they have probably similar lifestyles and are active and so 
since they're in the same geographical area and have access to the same things, it's not a health disparity. This family just feels less, they, they feel like they're less wealthy because they don't have as nice a car, but there's nothing about their health, which is really different. They're not more prone to be sick or anything like that. So it's not an example of health disparity. There's not that great a difference in the socioeconomic status. So it's not health disparity. It's not social capital either. Social capital is if you, it is the the cap, type of capital you have that's not related to material things. So it's related to things like network or your reputation and prestige in society. So it's based on non-material things. And here we're talking about cars. If we're talking about one family had a lower standing in society than a different family, then that might be them having a difference in social capital. But we're talking about material things. We're talking about cars, so social capital does not apply. So B is the correct answer for 14. In question 15, it says, Felix is a construction worker. He struggled to read as a child, but he can move his body skillfully and learn new tools and techniques for his job. According to Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, which intelligence intelligence does this describe? So Gardner's multiple intelligence theory states that there are different types of intelligence. So instead of just thinking about being able to you know read and write and study and answer tests and score high, like instead of thinking of intelligence only like that, there are different types of intelligence and Gardner stated multiple intelligences in his theory. All of these options are examples of them. And so we were told that Felix struggled to read. So with things like linguistic intelligence, he's not going to be that great, but he can move his body skillfully. So he's good at things related to his body. So we're looking for that type of intelligence. It's not spatial intelligence. This is also kind of related to the mind and being able to manipulate things in your mind in like 3D space. So you can see like things from many different angles and perspectives and you can understand the space around you. That's spatial intelligence. That's not what's going on. It's more so that he can move his own body skillfully. We're not talking about B, auditory musical either. So we're not talking about anything related to hearing. Once again, it's related to his body. C is linguistic, and this is a type that we're told he doesn't have because he struggles to read. So we can immediately rule out option C, and then only option D is left, and it is the correct answer. Kinesthetic intelligence refers to being able to fully be able to sense like where your body is in space and have full control of it. So full awareness of what your body is doing, even if your eyes are closed, your ears are closed, and everything, you can still tell where your legs are, where your feet are, what what they're all doing. So having full awareness of your body, that's kinesthetic intelligence. And we're told that he can move his body skillfully and then also learn new tools and techniques. So that means that he has kinesthetic intelligence. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. It's on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions and go through all the different answers and explain which one is right and which one's wrong and why. And we also have a full course going through all the different topics on the MCAT. So make sure you check all of that below. The link is in the description once again. That's, in f that's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.